quite a vast area we have covered uh, uh, today on a, a, a subject that seems nevertheless urgent. And uh, uh, starting again maybe to sum up with what Christoph said, I mean, what Christoph really did, he was showing, he was showing uh, so to say, the uh, normality of a lot of artists' life, namely stay, uh, moving from one residency to the other, uh, doing something like a, a, a site-specific work that is engaged with a curatorial practice, and making the residency somehow uh, the studio, which was uh, a, a quite, which is a maneuver. There are artists around that make their living in residences instead of studios uh, for, uh, for years, which shows somehow the separation of the art worlds into different production spheres. And uh, I think this is, this is the main subject one could talk about, you know, that there are different production spheres and they all reflect back to something uh, like an entity, which, is, which we seem to think as a spatial entity, as the studio, but the studio is much more a method a metaphor, as uh, in the end uh, uh, it has been widened by Boyana to, so to say, the nation state as a metaphor for the foundation, for, for so to say, the boards, the board, the boundaries, and uh, and the the frontiers of a practice that uh, is uh, politically engaged. Uh, uh, and engaged in uh, in terms of 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 talking about memory, I uh, don't want to uh, broaden it too much. You have you have very much in the memory, but when coming back to so to say the center of the subject, to that what uh, uh, Jens somehow uh, has said, and as well Beefy. I mean, if I look at uh, Beefy's typology of uh, the artist studio that you brought in from Nigeria, it is a typology that you could find in almost every Western city as well. So there is the old master that produces something like in a workshop. I mean, the Franz West workshop in Vienna would not have looked much differently than the one uh, that you showed to the studio that is uh, an idea of the studio that comes from more or less uh, uh, the production of media, what you showed with the young artists, actually, where, where, where the studio is much more a metaphor that comes out of, uh, uh, of a mediated practice uh, uh, or, or even a, a practice of uh, a music production where the studio as well had something like a high time in the 70s where people used to play on the studio and now it is fragmented into small entities like the computer and so on, and you showed the studio as a gathering place uh, uh, or as a communicative place in the absence of other possibilities in a, in, in a lot of the uh, uh, so-called post-colonial world where neither museums nor institutions take that chance, so the studio still is that type of communicative space. So the studio uh, is not just the artist studio of production, but it is a much wider and, 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 and broader entity that in, in, in one or the other way reflects uh, the TIFF the different uh, 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 strata of, of, of the art system. Jens, when you talked about uh, uh, the, you, in your book you talk about the dissolvance of the studio first, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then uh, somehow you reconstruct that dissolvance in saying that this entity is still existing and has something like a value. I, I, when, I, when I saw these uh, images of, uh, again, of the show that you did in 2006, yeah? Uh, this was, I think they are somehow crucial because of the art world after the 90s experience learned to understand that art is a wider practice, not so uh, if you bring it back to the, to the, to the uh, 1930s, you could say, well, uh, uh, as, as Boyana had mentioned, uh, Cubism was a, 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 a revolution in the studio, but Dada was a re revolution on the streets uh, in, in one or the other way. So, this 90s brought back the studio as a, a, a communicative space, a space, so to say, of research, a laboratory space that then even has been transformed into uh, the uh, system of art exhibitions and uh, Kunstvereins and so on. So you had a lot of practices that you usually would have in a studio. Uh, uh, like, an, like an entity where production and thinking goes on in, that, in a different way than it used to in the old master studio. And on the other hand, the museums had to cope back with uh, uh, something like showing uh, the aura of that production space, of the artwork that was, so to say, in the nucleus of production, so th where you could see all the archives aggregate, aggregated around to get that into something like an objectivized thing, not, uh, but, but the tension, as Christoph has mentioned, still stays between the practice 
or you have, or, or BCS has, has mentioned, between the practice outside, yeah? between the practice that accumulates and, be, and the practice that disseminates and the practice that socializes. I think in that way, the studio is a very, very uh, uh, vivid place still to be. Your perspective on, on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the notion, what is the conclusion that you give in the book? The conclusion to the, the conclusion book. to the to the so to say what is the what is the what is the uh, what is the what is the, the message? message that you give in the book? Sorry for my no 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 I yeah. understand what you yeah. mean, um, but I don't necessarily think there is really a message or, or a conclusion. I think that um, just like the art world has expanded and artistic practices have diversified, the idea of the studio itself has diversified. And I really like what you said, in t uh, uh, or using this term, production spheres. I think that's kind of an interesting way of putting it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this production sphere that is clearly still very much the traditional studio, where the artist makes, you know, traditional artwork, more or less. And then there's, of course, a completely enlarged uh, and expanded idea of, of what that is. And, you know, that could be Christoph with his laptop, uh, somewhere around the world, um, mm. feeding us things on his on, on his website. So I think this is sort of like more. Um, if if there is any conclusion, then you know it's it's we're looking at a much larger variety. There hasn't really been necessarily the end of the studio as it was proclaimed in the 1960s or 70s, rather. <laughs> um, but um, for, for reasons uh, that we should perhaps discuss, the studio you know is here to stay and and. Why that is might be an interesting sort of topic to, to, to look at. Yeah, what, what we at least have heard from 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 uh, uh, BC is that the studio still plays a value is a valuable entity to to uh, uh, show up, so to say, in the in the uh, itineraries of uh, curators that you need to highlight, uh, so to say, your practice mm -hmm. if you're living in a non-institutionalized, mm -hmm. so to say, art. Uh, uh, World. So you usually, what you do as a curator, you, you engage in studio visits. Mm -hmm. So you wanna you wanna see something like a production fair that 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 uh, gives you the idea of an of authenticity mm -hmm. of of a production that lets you somehow feel what this production is engaged in. Mm -hmm. So the studio visit is still one of the main. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, sources and resources for exhibition making in the curatorial world of the biennials and so on. So this, 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 this. But even the idea of studio visits is, of course, you know, very flexible. Now, I mean, out of like ten visits that I have or ten meetings that I have with an artist, maybe three take actually place in an actual studio. The other seven are somewhere in a hotel lobby or in a coffee place or in a restaurant or you know in an art school or somewhere in between. So that that that. Focus on the studio itself, I think, mostly exists when, when I actually go to see an artist making work, not when the artist, as in many cases, starts to outsource work or is engaged with making work that doesn't necessarily require a studio. So mm -hmm. even that sort of like has, has um, become much, much more flexible. But what I think is behind it is actually still really like a much more sort of restrictive and romantic notion of what an artist is and what art is all about. And, and I think it goes back to this idea of skill and, and that the artist is in this particular room or in this particular space where he or she is working something out that they have acquired through, uh, by, by being in an academy. And I have the feeling that we in the art would be somehow need that romantic notion of the artist and how she or he produces. You know, in, in the US, one of the things that we, of course, have to do is fundraise. And a lot of the money comes from private donors, most of these donors, the patrons, they are, they are also collectors. And there's nothing more than what they love to do is that if I take them to an artist studio. So we're going on a trip to Shanghai and everybody's like, oh, Jens, can you take us to the studio of Yan Fudong? Um, that's what they love. So there is this idea at or maybe we get like a, a sneak preview of the <coughs> next work. We maybe get a, you know, a look behind the, behind the door that is you know, some form of exclusive exclusivity that also exists there. So the studio is also some kind of a neoliberal commodity and uh, it has been used extensively in the real estate market, for example, when artists just like us uh, in uh, 96, we found these great studios in Bushwick, New York. Nobody would move to Bushwick. It was a really dangerous area. And uh, then we made it 
we made it livable. We, we made it hip. And uh, then the real estate market moved in and we were pushed out, of course. And other artists came in maybe with more money or with less uh, idea of, of less space and so on. And, uh, and so whole areas are uh, being actually integrated in a, in a commercial scheme of, of real estate uh, by uh, basically sending out artists in those areas uh, to make them um, to make them urban for for another kind of uh, clientele for clientele who who really has the money to pay the rents that the landlords uh, desire and also I think something maybe not similar but another uh, point that I, I'd like to criticize about those residences is also it's kind of like a post-colonial practice in a way you know like yeah. a lot of rich countries they have these residences in poor countries like. My studio in um, in Cairo was a studio financed by Switzerland, or also the the studio that I was offered in Warsaw uh, was somehow paid for by Pro Helvetia. So it's kind of like an exchange between rich countries and poor countries, and the rich countries are sending their artists into the poor countries and hope that results come out, or maybe exchange, or maybe communication. But it's also uh, it's also very representative, you know. Like like we always were engaged in whatever uh, little meetings at uh, let's say uh, at the embassy uh, with the ambassador and stuff like that. So so it was it's sometimes you feel like as an artist you're being uh, uh, traded as a commodity, almost like a toy, in some kind of like. A, bigger game where you don't necessarily play a rule. You can criticize it as much as you, as you want because you're part of, of a free speech democracy. But, uh, but, and they give you the money to, to do so and they send you to interesting corners in the world but at the end you feel instrumentalized you know, in a way. May I ask you something? Sure. You know, I mean, I would, uh, okay, it's all clear what artist in residence means. And I'm not interested in this aspect of your work because there are, there, there are so many artists who use these residences, but what I would like to ask you, you are using residences, but you have your reason. And I would like to know why you started to deal with these catastrophes. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I need an artist statement now. I mean, it can be personal, political, whatever you want. Oh my God. <laughs> no, because, I mean, there are so many artists on residences. So, I mean, and they sure, do no, different things. And the, you do, you are specific in what you do. And this is for me also unique. So okay, tell, the, tell us. The residences came much later as a result yeah. of what I was doing as a, as a practice, because I was a little bit successful with, with my uh, project. Uh, dealing with the issue of disasters and uh, the disaster work was something that came out of my studio practice in Brussels with, which was probably part of a personal obsession but I, I don't even think it's very personal because I think everybody is obsessed with disasters in one way or the, or the other and the media are actually feeding us the disasters every day and somehow I felt like there was uh, there must be a way as an artist to digest these like portions of disasters that we mm -hmm. we're being fed every day in another way than uh, the media suggests. So I was hoping to find a way how I could look at disasters in a in a different way, in in a slow way, whereas mm -hmm. the media were fast, mm -hmm. in an ironic way, whereas the media were always dealing with with pain and with. With or or also like public memory deals with with pain. I I, I I was always hoping to to find a counterpoint to that official representation of uh, disaster that happens mostly through the media and somehow also through memories, uh, mm -hmm. uh, memorials, as as you were mm -hmm. uh, talking about. I mean, like almost every big disaster has its official. Uh, memorial and I was always uh, steering away from those memorials trying to find like another point of view that is more like the point of view of somebody who 
takes a postcard by accident much mm -hmm. too late. And so mm -hmm. this became my, my traveling project. And the residence is, I, I kind of uh, uh, instrumentalized those residences to make, to, to continue my research in, in other cor corners of the world to, to, to continue this. But then at a certain point, I was also coined into this is the, 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 the artist who deals with disaster. He's a disaster artist. I was called a disaster artist. And, and I was fed up with that. So I came up with this reaction that I was like, doing, okay, I'm doing a hippie movement now. I, I don't want to do disasters anymore, especially in Poland, especially where everything is so heavy mm -hmm. and it's the, the memory of the Holocaust and the six million Jews and, and Auschwitz and, and so on. I could have done greatly there, you know, like mm -hmm. I could have traveled the country to take my pictures and stuff like that. I still don't have any pictures of Polish disasters other than a small one in Katowice that nobody remembers. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a counter, uh, like in my own brain, it was a, a, a counter reaction to, to my own work in a way. So, so it seems that we, that we agree on uh, this, in, at least in this round, that in uh, that, uh, so to say, more conservative notion, the studio is a relative conservative agent as well, be it of gentrification, be it of, so to say, reconstructing the idea of the artist being, uh, uh, being so to say, uh, an agent even of a colonial, uh, a colonial agenda in the art exchange system. Nevertheless, I mean, there is another type of studios which is much more bound to collectivity, to practice, and to, uh, uh, to uh, so to say, an engagement which uh, is m mainly not shared by a single artist. We have been talking about single artists or single signature studies at the moment, not single artist studies, uh, uh, studios, but single signature studios. Uh, but there is a lot of compounds around. Uh, you see it in the world, and I'm sure that they exist in Nigeria yeah, as well, course. where the studio has a, a much broader idea of a production place that is so so that 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 where, where, where there is a shared agenda, mm -hmm. so to say, of of producing mm -hmm. around uh, certain topics that are contemporary contemporary topics, and and there this idea of the studio is totally extended into a different field. That's partly started already in the 60s and in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Is this existing in Nigeria that type of studios? Well, I was just um, mentioning to um, one of the. Um, um, audience members here that there's a, a young artist um, in Nigeria who um, has sort of started what I guess one can call a you know transdisciplinary kind of studio. Um, she, her background is in architecture and whenever she has a major project coming up she also works with you know four, five, six or seven um, other artists, you know, whether they're painters, um, sculptors working in metal. But I think what's interesting and at least seems fairly new to me is the way that um, she goes about it. And that's um, inviting five, six or seven studio assistants. But not only, it's not only about making work. It's also a place for learning, for exchange, for sharing information, and during um, a period of three to six months whilst she develops um, her exhibition, they also have you know, talks, they have crits, they, have, um, they watch videos on other artists' um, methodologies, they read texts, so there's you know, a wide range of um, different um, activities that are going on where you sort of have this coming together of, I guess, you know, the traditional studio where production, you know, is, is, is going on, but at the same time, you know, you have this um, educational space. And I think, you know, that's something that I'm interested in, you know, watching and seeing what kind of work and what kinds of initiatives comes out of this way of thinking about studios within a Nigerian context that is, as you have seen, extremely um, um, traditional, extremely conservative. Um, I wouldn't yet talk about, um, you know, post-studio or post-the-post post, um, studio because um, most artists um, are still working, you know, alone um, with their canvas and their paints or in their, you know, sculpture studio and, um, um, you know, making works with the hands. They're not outsourcing um, in a way that is being done in other parts of the world. Also, I think it's, you know, important um, 
um, site because, you know, with the lack of infrastructure, you know, where do you go to meet? You know, the museums are not there, the, you know, non-profit spaces uh, are not there. And I think also in that kind of context, you know, different, different um, um, notions, like, you know, Jens is talking about the expanded um, um, field. Um, I think that in that kind of a context where nothing is really written down, I mean, you have the sort of traditional Western studio, but I think out of that can come new ways of thinking about, you know, the studio. Um, and a lot of artists are now beginning to, you know, work together. And I think in the next couple of years, you know, it will be really interesting to actually um, begin to focus on this idea of the studio, which, as I said, you know, is, is, is very um, almost, you know, non-existent, and seeing, you know, in which way does that impact on the work that's going to be produced in the years to come, and, you know, what kind of studio practice, you know, is going to exist. But also another thing that I wanted to mention, um, which there wasn't time to do is, and what's interesting for me is I sort of think through one, my presentation, the um, research that um, I've accumulated, I would say, over the last uh, month. It's not a lot, but it's the beginning. And looking again or thinking again about um, the images of Benemumu, the modern African artist, and I'm thinking that, you know, the way in which his, um, he, he allowed his studio and himself to be photographed, especially at that time in the 40s and 50s, you know, it's very, very political. So when you take it into an African context or into a non-Western context where you have, um, you know, um, how do I say, preconceived ideas of the way in which an African, you know, should work and the kind of work they should be doing, um, it's really interesting to look closely at the series of pictures, how he stands in the pictures, how he dresses in the pictures. Um, I think that's you know, very, very interesting with regards to modern art in Africa, in Nigeria. Um, also, I think that um, um, I know, no, Bulu, what I didn't mention, you know, the first um, African artist is that what really spurred him on, apart from this passion for being an artist, what really spurred him on was also um, a very, was a, how would I put it, was a, um, a, a political agenda in the sense that, you know, he, he was being told by the colonials um, all the time that, you know, as an African, he doesn't have the ability to do realist paintings. So his goal, you know, apart from, bringing art um, into Nigeria is to prove that wrong. Um, he went to England as well and studied um, um, in England very briefly. Um, he was in Paris as well, um, studied very briefly there, and you know, wanted to show that you know, in Africa, we can also do realist paintings. So it's really interesting to look at the early history You mean of figurative? Figurative, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting to look at, you know, the early history of um, modern art, studio practice in Africa, and begin to think about it as a political act. Uh, I would open for a first round to the audience. Uh, Edwin, I don't need that. <laughs> I can speak loudly enough. No, I'm Edwin from Austria, living in India now. Mm -hmm. Christoph, catastrophe, disaster. You know, in Greek, disaster, metanoia, chaos, point, it means change. And in Greek and Chinese, crisis, catastrophe means crisis, has two characters, danger and chance, opportunity. Interesting? Yeah. Disaster, Latin asterus, the star. I'm separated from the star. So I've been looking for the stars in catastrophe. Because catastrophe means change, it means suffering. Oscar Wilde says, where there is suffering, there's holy ground. And Dostoevsky says, suffering is the sole origin of consciousness. And the mythologist Joseph Campbell, you have to go down into the abyss where your treasures are. Number two, remember. In Chinese, it's fascinating. Number one in Chinese means to remember. The word, in all cultures, Indian culture and on and on, 
Number one is the divine. And it means two, then it means remember. The moment that I remember, that I'm a member of one plus one plus one of these six billion people, I see that the other one is myself. Why is the other one myself? My mother didn't know, my father didn't know, my teachers didn't know. And an American lady told me, when you look into the pupil, when I look into the pupil of this fascinating man, you know what I see? Who knows? I see myself because the pupil is a real mirror. Can you imagine this? The other one is myself. That's why in Russian language, you know Russian? In Russian language, the other one means the friend of the friend. In German, der Freund, den Freund. I love the other one, I love the friend of the friend. I hate the other one, I hate the friend of the friend. That's why in all cultures, you have sentences in connection with oneness. In China, all under heaven, one family. In, our, in Latin, family means, I'm finishing almost, yes. Family means famulus servant. And the last thing I want to mention is studio. To my mind, there's only one studio, and perhaps you agree, it can only be within myself. What is within myself, I project on the outside world. So when I looked at the lovely photographs, when I'm in harmony, my room inside looks rather pretty. Gnotis auton, you have in Greek, know yourself. You have it in all cultures. If I'm not in harmony, I have a problem. But they've got harmony in three cultures, Chinese, Bahasa, Indonesia, and in Greek, it's very interesting. Then I finish, okay? Harmony in Chinese has two spears, but not attacking, but crossed. And then a lamb and a human being. First, a small conflict. And then we can remember well. But first we have to go through a little bit of suffering. In Greek, Harmonia, the goddess of harmony, her father is the god of war. But the mother is the goddess of love. First, a little bit of conflict. Perhaps Indonesia, Indonesia is Muslim and, and, and Bali is, is Hindu. It has a trigger, like a trigger of a gun. So I hope you harmony without a lot of triggers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Was, uh, I, was I there a have question laughed. added to the, to the podium? Or I, was I would have loved yeah. to have you in my hippie movie. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to have you in my hippie movie. <laughs> <laughs> Further questions? So, do you have questions on the podium to each other? So then, Poyana, please. No, I just wanted to ask, Busy. Uh, you know, in your center, do artists use your center as a studio as well? This you forgot to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> this is important, I think. Yeah, um, what we do, we do um, at the Center for Contemporary Art, um, we, what we have is a program which is, It'll be like the Summer Academy, and that's um, once a year for one month where we have a theme and we usually have between 10 to 12 artists um, who are, as you know, if you want, in, using the gallery space, you know, the gallery becomes a studio space and we have a faculty, you know, of different people who, artists, curators, writers, and it's an opportunity, you know, I keep emphasizing this sort of lack of infrastructure and platforms and possibilities. And, you know, this is an opportunity for artists to come together, you know, come together one, come and talk about a project that they're developing or an idea they have and interact with people, not only from Nigeria, but from around the world and, you know, use it as a catalyst to move to the next stage of um, the work um, that they're doing. Um, but that's just something that happens, you know, for a month, once a year. But for instance, if we have an art, invite an artist to make an exhibition in the gallery and do in situ work, is he or she then making a studio work? Because then gallery is a studio for in situ works, or yeah. it's not. Well, yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, there's that possibility. We've had a performance artist who, you know, came, started um, developing the work over a one-week period, 
and you know that resulted in the final performance. So I guess in a way it's you know he's there for a week. It's his studio for a week, mm -hmm. and I think you know we have that flexibility in our space for artists to come in and you know experiment in a way that they may not be able to in the other spaces that are available, which tend to be commercial galleries. So we do provide that possibility. A lot of the commercial market actually needs the studio as a, back, as a, as a backbone of the artist, so to say, where, where objective right production can be, can be made. On the other hand, this notion of education was quite interesting as well. Uh, coming back to the studio, so to say, of the, uh, even of the, uh, of the medieval practices or of the Renaissance practices, this is a new notion that, that comes into the studio. I mean, the art, the art education is relatively diversified. Nevertheless, you see a lot of uh, uh, postgraduate, so to say, educational mm -hmm. work done mm -hmm. in, in compounds that one could call artist studios mm -hmm. or, or that, that gather around practices from, from the Peshovshis in, that you mentioned in, in, in uh, uh, Bucharest in the, in, in the 60s too, to may it even be uh, uh, that what uh, uh, people like Ai Weiwei are doing, yeah? Mm -hmm. in, 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 on both sides, so to say, of the, of the, of the scala. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is an educational aspect as well in the studio uh, that is, I think, uh, now getting some drive as well. So there is a mm -hmm. lot of, there is, there is a lot of things around the spatial entity still. Mm -hmm. uh, not always like a, a single spatial mm -hmm. entity. I think this mm -hmm. is another aspect that you've touched here, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite mm -hmm. important. And especially in, in contexts like mm -hmm. yours, that might be uh, mm -hmm. uh, as well a, a very challenging mm -hmm. uh, a thing mm -hmm. as, as the academy system usually mm -hmm. is lacking Mm. Uh, or is very uh, out of uh, date. Is very conservative. Mm. Yeah. On the other hand, you see this debate. For instance, I remember that I was in, in, in China like three years ago for the first Chinese art critic about it. There was a huge debate on industrial production of the Chinese art world mm. and that what, uh, so to say, an identity production of an art piece could be. Mm. And there have been two fractions. The one, the more conservative, so to say, Western mm. type of mm. the idealistic art mm. production, and the other, let's produce something in an almost shop-like compound mm. that produces that, com mm. uh, that, that, that content mm. and counters the industrial production that is made for the Chinese art markets. Mm. And all that needed somehow this entity of the studio, this mm. spatial or mm -hmm. mental entity mm -hmm. of the studio to be reflected mm -hmm. because otherwise you could not reflect it. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. it, it, it it's always uh, uh, that, 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 that notion around that you can reflect the different modes of production. Mm -hmm. I think we had a very, very uh, 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 interesting event. Yeah, definitely. No, I have one more question yeah. for you. Uh, you know, now, the ex I'm sorry, first of all, I still don't have your book, so I have to ask the question, maybe you have it or maybe not. In your book, in exhibition it would be difficult, but in your book, do you also consider artist performances held in the studio or it is always held with the studio is linked to the object? No, it's not linked to the object at all. And I think also in many cases, it's not even linked to a physical space. Mm -hmm. So it can also be something that takes yeah, yeah. place outside. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily describe the studio as an isolated space mm -hmm. that is disconnected mm -hmm. from reality. But if you think about, you know, Alan Capra, for example, um, Fluxus. Mm -hmm. uh, Yvonne Reiner as well. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Those are, are, are practices that certainly take place much more in a public uh, realm. Um, and I showed you the, the work there by, by Bruce Norman, for example. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the yeah. lack of You're materials right. mm -hmm. um, produced, you know, at that point, mm -hmm. of course, a sort of move towards using their own body and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. political explorations of the body and identity have always sort of like produced work that not necessarily always manifests itself mm -hmm. in an object. So that is certainly considered. But when you did you did you show uh, Nauman in, in the in the exhibition? Yeah, but not actually the How? early the fo uh, as a photo no, or as a, a film. As a, as a, a film of a his film. studio, which is okay. a documentation where you see basically not much other than the mice running around. So the mm -hmm. mice are sort of what goes on there during the during the. Yeah. There was another piece that perhaps was interesting in relationship to performance, which was that we uh, brought in the floor of Dieter Roth's studio. In, in, uh, from Basel, we took the whole floor out and then exhibited it as, as almost like a painting. You know, there's the mats that he always used and present like the like paintings. So there's been like various works that Peter Roth has done 
um, circling around the studio. And, mm -hmm. and that, of course, is, it are the traces of his activities, mm -hmm. you know, working with all kinds of materials that fall on the ground, whether it is, you know, a clay or it is metal or it is, you know, paint that drops off from somewhere. And you didn't have Kozarich piece from Documenta, no? No. <laughs> this is Equist Documenta. <laughs> Entire well, studio from Zagreb was brought and installed. Which, in which document was that? Uh, Equis. It's it, uh, Envisors. Oh, okay. So that must have is been like 2001 or 2002, right? Two, two maybe. 2002, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which okay. brings in the studio as the Gesamtkunstwerk as such, which is, a, is a, which is another notion. Especially in Rhodes, it was like that. The studio exactly, yeah. was, uh, was the space uh, where he aggregated, so to say, all the energy that he could get from outside and, and, and put it into something like then a physical entity again, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. Is there any further question from here? No, I have a question for the audience. Mm. <sighs> Can I ask? Yeah. You know, uh, I didn't have enough time, but it would be very interesting subject, and we discussed it now outside, and I would like the, the, the student to give us more detail, detail about this event in, in, in Moscow. You know, a riot, uh, Pussy Riot in Russia mm -hmm. made this performance in the Christian Orthodox Cathedral in Moscow. And in that sense, cathedral plus Christian Orthodox is uh, treated as a studio. And now the girls are on court. And could you give us more details about the event in your home country, please? Give, give him a mic. He's, he's standing up there. Yes, hello. I, I think that uh, the court is now a, a studio as well, but the studio for the much more respectful and uh, rich artists than Pussy Riot, because uh, in the court at first uh, the um, how say the, the the guilt of them is like something uh, that they uh, how how you say it that they tried to struggle the Russian holy like treasures which were not touchable for 500 years. It's official, I mean. This, uh, this was written in official documents. And uh, there are three people who are suffering from their performance. Uh, the first one uh, is the um, old woman who uh, took the money from the audience and uh, she said that, uh, I mean, that uh, she usually took the, take, take the money from the audience and she said that after this performance, uh, which was only four minutes, uh, but for hours she could not take the money from the audience. So uh, the second man is the man who is keeping the key from the, from the cathedral and he has insomnia now for four months because of the, because of the devil uh, came out from, the, from, from these girls. And the third one is just suffering because he has now uh, some kind of acne on his face or something like this, and for sure because of the devil, which again came out of these girls. So I think it's a real studio now in the court, and uh, we have an online translation every day, and fr on Friday will be the last, uh, the last day of the process, and I think that uh, the masterpiece will come out for sure. And um, as you know, our uh, new president, uh, not so new, but uh, again, new again president, uh, he uh, made a statement <laughs> on a, a renewed president, yeah, over and over again. And he uh, made a statement on Pussy Riot that um, for sure they already were punished and uh, it's not that good to, uh, to, to, to take them in prison, uh, but it's the court which, uh, which should decide. And for sure after this, uh, the court, uh, two days already in a row, is giving more and more opportunities to the advocates of the Pussy Riot. So it's, very, it's quite funny, yeah. No, but it's a pity that they are not translating it in English, but it will be after. Now the on online translation uh, is, uh, is in Russian, in, uh, in one of Russian newspapers so in the blog. Thank you. No, but the trick in Putin's statement was that before he was interviewed, I don't know, I, I'm now crazy about Russia Today TV station, just watching it every day. Putin said that first he situated this in a larger context. He said something like, I cannot quote, uh, what would happen if somebody would do this in a moshee or in a, in a, in, in a Muslim church of Jew or a synagogue? You know, he, he relativized the issue, like religion is, uh, yeah, all over the, the place, uh, very, very uh, tactile thing, you know. And then he, he said he hoped they would be not punished severely. 
Yeah, the, the last thing that uh, after that uh, they had a decision from the um, main uh, how is it main Muslim priest and main uh, um, Jewish priest who said that uh, it, it it were already this kind of thing already happened but they don't have law in no no nor in Quran nor in uh, nor in Torah to punish for this and uh, the Orthodox Church is uh, taking trying to take this kind of punishment from the New Testament Testament and uh, exactly from the from the mountain speech. It's, it's very strange. Okay, so Cooks, Cooks call the working places studios as well sometimes. So we go to the Cafe Kult uh, in Künstlerhaus. I thank the podium and I thank you in the audience for joining in. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.